morning everybody. Thank you all for coming along this morning. You're very welcome. A very special welcome to all the relatives, friends of the volunteers who left this, these premises on Easter Sunday 1916 to play their part in the fight for Irish freedom. It's to the memory, it's to the memory of these brave men that the John Valley O'Reilly Society have commissioned this beautiful bronze plaque. This project has taken a couple of years to complete, but we are here today. And I want to thank the committee members of the John Valley O'Reilly Society for the time and effort to put into this project. It's been a job well done, as we now have this fine memorial to remind future generations of our historic past. I would also like to thank Declan Flood for his invaluable help and support all the way. It's now a pleasure to introduce Marcus Howard. He's a well-known historian and filmmaker. Marcus has a personal interest in the Rising as he had a relative who was a volunteer in Dundalk. He has made documentaries about the Rising and has very kindly offered to give us a short talk this morning on the events of that historic day. Marcus Howard. Hello everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and relatives of the Loud Volunteers, welcome to an historic moment in County Loud's 1916 history. Thank you to the Knights of Hibernia for the invitation to speak, and especially to Sean Byrne and the committee who have been an active force in getting this plaque up to memorialise the Loud Volunteers. I would especially like to pay thanks to Porrick Agnew, who is here in military uniform, representing his relative Hugh Carney, head of Defence Forces, and his family. We'd like to thank the ONE who did such a great job with Piper Vinnie Murray. We express our gratitude and thanks for giving this event such a great lift. Also, thanks to Alan Bogan who was the glue uh, to helping get our book, The Loud Night, uh, Volunteers 1916, published. Uh, I would especially um, like to say that thanks to Nolag New as well, who was so involved in fighting our case. Uh, for 2015-2016 and I hope Noel is awarded an another medal as has just been announced that the fire service will be getting 1916 medals for the role in the 2016 commemorations and I can't think of anybody more deserving than Noel who was on the Loud 1916 Relatives Committee. Now my name is Marcus Howard and I'm the great grand nephew of 1916 Sergeant Major of the Loud Volunteers Arthur Green. I'm also, as uh, has he mentioned, a history filmmaker. My mother Frances Rocks is, is wearing his medal today. This small stone plaque that you see behind me has been on Cambrassa Street since 1956, the 40th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. In 1956, it was loud 1916 volunteer Paddy McHugh who gave a speech before the original plaque unveiling right here. This plaque commemorates a special moment in Dundalk's history. The 1916 loud volunteers who mobilised from Dundalk to RD they were also from Grange Value in Dunlear to Castle Bellingham, Dunboyne, Slane and then Terrellstown have a very interesting story to play. This story stems from the John Boyle O'Reilly Hall that you see behind us. They were one of very few groups around the country outside the Dublin city to ignore Owen McNeill's countermanding order. They chose to follow the instructions given by Patrick Pierce to form a protective ring around Dublin city. The Commandant of the Loud Volunteers, Donal O'Hannigan, recognised Patrick Pierce and not Owen McNeill as his commanding officer. Their journey was steeped in uncertainty as 97 men made their way from County Loud to Dublin from this hall. Leading up to the 1916 Rising, leaders such as Countess Markovich, Sean McDermott and John McBride visited and gave talks in Dundalk. It was also in Dundalk that the more politically militant direction was decided upon in respect to the Gaelic League in the years leading up to 1916, with the resignation of Douglas Hyde, then President of the Gaelic League. This town is steeped in history, 
we only have to look around. Across the road to my left is Dundalk Post Office, which was deliberately slowing down dispatches to the Royal Irish Constabulary to prevent them getting up-to-date dispatches during Easter week. Dundalk Town Hall is where one famous incident happened in the lead-up to the 1916 Rising. The Irish Volunteers and the Irish National Volunteers had split as an organisation, and the Irish Volunteers were attacked in the Town Hall for having a meeting. One of Louth's more famous leaders is Paddy Hughes, and he fought off many Irish National Volunteers with a poker. Paddy Hughes was a driving force in the dock in the lead up to 1916. Also, one of the more famous moments in this town, in 1910, during the accession of King George V, a small band of Irish Volunteers stood on the private property of the Maid of Erin statue at the square and sang defiantly, God Save Ireland while a huge number of RIC were singing God Save the King. Photographs were taken, it was seen as a huge publicity coup for Irish freedom. Oh and by the way, the green flag with the harp was raised and a republic was proclaimed in 1910. Took the Dublin folks another six years. Come on lads. <laughs> Come on to town as I say. Uh, remember also, McGuill's shop on the corner by the square which was also used for meetings when they were afraid of this hall behind us uh, getting raided. Remember the brave men who mobilised the Grange value and common them on. Remember that many of the men used to also meet at Stog Track in this town to discuss matters. And some of them, such as Arthur Green, was at the famous 1915 Patrick Pierce oration in Glasnevin Cemetery. This is our town, and we should be proud of our history, as well as our football. Next time you see a 1916 writing documentary, movie, book, or newspaper article, remember that County Loud had an important role to play and followed its orders to the letter, despite everything going against them. They persevered. They did everything they could to help and to fight. And remember, they had mobilized a day earlier to reach their planned destination. They left this hall on Easter Sunday, as it says in the original plaque. Now, when I'm gonna talk about the original plans, and then what actually happened. The original plans. Pierce wanted them to meet up with the Mead volunteers and to read a 1916 proclamation at the Hill of Tara for historical reasons. And they were to assemble and mobilize in this building on the Sunday morning. Commandant of the 1916 Loud Volunteers, Don O'Hannigan, was one of the very few who knew of the plans of the Rising. John McDermott was one of the masterminds of the 1916 Rising and planned to assemble a ring around Dublin. The plan wasn't for the Rising to occupy the GPO in Dublin and wait for the British to come and then surrender. The plan was far more complex than that. The plan nationwide was to cut communication wires and railway lines and take over RIC barracks. In Patrick Pearce's own words, the whole point of the Loud Volunteers forming the ring around Dublin was 1. To prevent an attack on Dublin from the rear. Two, to prevent British reinforcements from entering the city. Three, to maintain a supply of food for the volunteers fighting in Dublin. Four, and this is the most important one, in the case of an evacuation of the city by the Dublin volunteers, to hold lines of retreat over towards the west where the Galway volunteers had risen. The GPO garrison and other fighting areas in Dublin who would be feeling tired after a few days fighting could move out towards Dublin Four Courts and North King Street out towards Ashburn where a fresh wave of legs from the Louth, the Mead and Fingal battalions could provide support and refreshments in the fight before moving out west. A hardy contingent actually made it from the Dundalk volunteers to Terrell's Town House and could hear the rifle fire in Dublin City. They tried their best to link up with Thomas Ash's Fingal Battalion who were winning against the RIC in Ashburn. Many of the IRB, which were the people really in the know, were in the Loud Volunteers and were aware of the plans. Now making the Film 3 Rising Stories YouTube channel, I've established some important links with all the 1916 films I've been making. It helps to give a fuller understanding of the 1916 Rising nationwide. Commandant Donal O'Hannigan, a few weeks before the 1916 Rising took place, had met in a secret location with Tom Clark, Sean McDermott, Eamon Kant, Cahal Brewer, Patrick Pierce, and James Connolly shortly before the Rising to go over the plans. So what actually happened? Paddy Hughes broke the news to Sean McEntee that word had come that the Rising was on. In the film Dundalk 16 Rises on my YouTube channel, 
uh, the little placards on Brassett Street here begins the story of the brave men of Dundalk who mobilised the Easter Rising with few arms, lots of enthusiasm and a great store of courage. On Easter week 1916, there were few rifles in Dundalk. The loud volunteers had planned to commandeer or to take charge or to basically nick rifles in RD belonging to the National Volunteers who would have been very pro uh, World War I at the time and they had regularly clashed with the 1916 Loud Volunteers. The Loud Volunteers did manage to get those weapons. Despite Owen McNeill's countermanding order to call off the Rising, the Dundalk men and Loud Volunteers steadfastly proceeded on their journey, unlike many others. Back in Dundalk, James McWillan sought proof of Owen McNeill's signature on the countermanding order, which was asking to cancel all mobilisations around the country. Angela Matthews of Louds coming them on and a local Morris priest declared the signature genuine. But the Loud volunteers were already on the move. Over 40 Dundalk men met another 50 men at the workhouse on the RD Road. In a flurry of activity, O'Hannigan attempted to seek clarification on whether the Rising was definitely going ahead or not by sending a number of dispatches to Dublin. According to James Judge Dunn, 90 men left Workhouse Hill. On reaching Slain, there was a standoff between the Loud Volunteers and 60 RIC men. Each took a position on either side of the Bridge of Slain. Sean McEntee is sent with another dispatcher to Liberty Hall to find out if the Rising is on or not. Later on, Sean McEntee arrives back from Liberty Hall as the men are slowly walking home in case the Rising is genuinely called off. McEntee met the Loud Volunteers at Lurgan Green with News and Pierce on Monday. Dublin is in arms. You will carry out your original instructions. The Dundalk men immediately swung into action, arresting two of the RIC men who were trailing them. 18 officers, five cars, and their drivers were taken prisoner from Ferry House races. The Loud Volunteers proceeded in a convoy to Castle Bellingham. In Castle Bellingham, McEntee told the two RIC men to stand alongside the railing. They were lined up. Shortly afterwards, Constable McGee arrived on bicycle and he was asked to dismount and to search them. And there was a dispatch, there was a dispatch taken. Soon after, another car arrived. It was British Lieutenant Dunville who refused to come out of the car. There was a bit of aggression shown by him. As the cars were slowly moving, it was thought that Captain Dunville made a move to draw a weapon. Loud volunteer Paddy McHugh fired a shot and Paddy claimed the second shot went out that evening, but nobody claimed responsibility for the other shooting. Both McGee and Dunville were wounded. McGee was fatally and died later that evening. O'Hannigan continued sending dispatches for orders on Tuesday and Wednesday. Dispatcher and Loud volunteer Peter Clifford then met James Conley in the GPO. Conley de declared upon hearing their exploits, the brave men of Loud. British cordons and checkpoints made it too difficult for Clifford to return to his men. Also in the GPO, Patrick Pierce motivated his men during Easter week by telling them how a large band of men were coming from Dundalk. Back in Carrollstown, the Loud Volunteers heard the heavy gunfire from Dublin City. Donald O'Hannigan was trying to find Thomas Ash to get information on what was happening with the Fingal Battalion, who were on the move. The rest of the Loud Volunteers stayed in the house awaiting orders to proceed. Ash had arranged to meet on Saturday, but had been tragically arrested before the meeting could take place. Pierce had at this stage surrendered in Dublin, despite many other areas fighting well. When O'Hannigan returned to the Loud Volunteers in Turlestown House, suddenly word came that a battalion of Lancers with two field pieces were going to surround the Loud Volunteers of Turlestown. If the men did not surrender, the British, or, sorry, the British Lancers had orders to shell the place. The Loud Volunteers moved location and then decided to stand their ground. The Lancers encircled them. According to Patrick McHugh's witness statement, he noticed Donal O'Hannigan leaving the house with his rifle and asked him where he was going. O'Hannigan said they were surrounded and they were not going to surrender. I love this bit. The men, one and all, said they would stand by O'Hannigan and obey all his orders. O'Hannigan said they would take no action unless they were attacked. After the Lancers passed by, O'Hannigan announced a demobilisation. There were only 13 men left from the original 90. When word had been brought that Dublin had surrendered, Arthur Green recalled, we all felt disappointed. They oiled and buried their ammunition and returned to Dundalk. 
30 were arrested and marched to the jail and were sent by strong military escort to Richmond Barracks in Dublin where they were tried and several were interned in Frongock in Wales. Now about us, about Loud, about Dundalk, Owen McLaughlin, Patrick Pierce's great grandnephew, or grandnephew, was so impressed with the perseverance of the Loud volunteers following his great uncle's orders after doing our documentary on them that he volunteered to write the foreword to our book on the Loud Volunteers 1916. I'm currently making a film with the Pierce family. I'd like to give a special mention to Maxi the Taxi, Mark Cavanagh. Why? Because he did something very important. He helped me find Arthur Green's grave this summer. He was very near uh, my great grandfather who had fought in World War I. Uh, many Irish families, including many here, had those who supported home rule and those who supported the rising. Uh, thanks, Mark, it really meant a lot. This new plaque unveiled today by the John Boyle O'Reilly Society is a poignant and fitting tribute to the late volunteers. The John Boyle O'Reilly KOH building's historical significance has now been suitably remembered and should not be forgotten. Last thing I want to say. Last weekend saw the end of the centenary of World War I. And in a few weeks in January 2019, we'll see the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the 1919-21 Irish War of Independence, as well as the centenary of the first dog. Buildings are living monuments to those who sacrificed so much to give us our freedom. Point out to the younger generation this plaque you're about to see today, as you are the keepers of that flame. The John Boyle O'Reilly Hall tells more than the story of 1916. It also tells the story of Dundalk. We should remember that. So thank you very much, and I hope that I've done my relatives, your relatives, but most importantly, Loud's 1916 history justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that excellent speech. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to proceed with the uh, unveiling of the plaque.
that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this morning. <coughs> we've had a lovely, lovely little ceremony here, and um, we've this to remember it anyway. This beautiful flag. So, thank you very much. Thank you.